This is great. Hello, everyone from around the world. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> and team, if you can just pop on your videos, uh, just to quickly say hello to everybody, those of you that can, that do have a camera. Hello. And for all of our attendees that are currently joining us, these are our Niagara College team members who are here to help you today and that will be responding to questions uh, in the Q&A session. A couple uh, quick reminders for everybody. Um, please place your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to see beside the uh, participants button, you'll be able to see a Q&A button. And please make sure that you're putting your questions in there rather than the chat button. And we'll be able to respond to all of your questions. We'll be able to track them so that we can share those more easily uh, with all participants and with everybody else, okay? So just remember, use the Q&A uh, section to ask your questions and the chat section is just to be able to say hello to everybody. Uh, if you'd like, we'd love to be able to hear where you're from and where you're joining us from. So if you want to add that in the chat section uh, to be able to say hello and say what country you're, you're uh, checking in from, that would be wonderful. I see we've got a couple of return people here today, which is great. So some students that are really eager and, and really uh, trying to learn about Niagara College and what it is that they need to do to be successful. Uh, so that's wonderful to see. And uh, who was that, Fernando? Who had popped in and, and had come back to say hello? It's uh, Janish. So Janish oh, just wonderful. said, hey, hey, Fernando, nice to see you again. So cool. Nice to see all you guys back. Nice and to it, see you, Janish. Satsuriyakal and uh, namaste. Welcome back. All right. So... We have some wonderful guests today that will be talking about technology. And of course, they are the head guys to talk about technology. Uh, so these are the people that are going to help support you as you uh, join the college, as you get enrolled in your classes, as you're, as you're starting your programs online or in a hybrid fashion where you've got some components online and some components in class. Uh, how do you do that? And how do you, how do you access the various applications that you need to how do you do that from your from your home country um, what's the bandwidth you need from your internet connection to be able to do this successfully all of those great things so i'll ask that uh john and john the twins uh step forward a little bit and john levy who is our chief information officer at niagara college uh is over here on my left and we have john hilbing who is our associate director of Client, John, help me, help me. Client something, client user experience. Client support services. That's right. It's everything about you people. It's it's everything about supporting all of you. So wonderful. Um, and John and John, thanks for joining us. It, it, this is your first Zoom session with International, is it not? That is true. Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. And we, well, and we look forward to it. Well, I know our students are really eager about it. We, uh, we of course, we, we get questions daily uh, from students around the world just wondering what it is that they need to do to be successful in their class, especially from a technology perspective. How are they going to do their courses and programs online? Uh, and what tools do they need to be successful? So, of course, this is one of a two-part series. Uh, this one is specifically focusing on technology requirements and how you access them. Next Friday, we'll be doing a joint panelist session uh, with both our academic areas and uh, John Levy, uh, Levy and John Hilping as well, uh, about all about online learning. So you'll be able to get the perspective of both the academic uh, areas and from an ITFS perspective, uh, being able to see how online program works. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I think I'll turn it over to you, John Levy. Okay. Thank you very All much, right. Howard. Uh, uh, 
welcome everyone and I'm really glad to see you come out. Uh, we're going to try to keep this as non-geeky as we possibly can at this point in time, uh, but kind of walk you through uh, some of the uh, different items that are very technical in nature, shall we say, but don't, but are really important to your learning outcomes and making sure that you have a great experience on your side, because it's all about what you learn. It's not about what we can do. It's all about how we can actually provide that learning environment to you. Uh, you have to help us out a little tiny bit uh, on, on one side, and that's making sure that you have the minimum configurations that uh, are required as far as computing resources are concerned. We're going to talk a little bit about account access and how you, uh, uh, how you actually get to those resources that we have available. We'll talk a little bit about everyone's worried you can't go into a computer lab. How are we going to simulate that computer lab for you? And we're going to talk a little bit about if you don't have the minimum requirements, what can you do? We're trying to also help you out in that particular case. And then if all else fails, or if you just have a general question, we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to support you from a distance uh, as far as IT support is concerned. And our, we'll talk about our IT service desk. So with that, let's just start off with minimum computing requirements. And by the way, uh, John Hilbing, I'll be taking pauses uh, every so often and John will fill in any particular details uh, if there's anything extra to uh, add. Because sometimes I can talk up here and John can talk at all the various levels if you have any questions. So minimum computing requirements, we're asking students, in most cases we are a Microsoft-based college. So there are a few programs that use other technologies, but in most cases, we do count on a Windows 10 environment. So we are recommending that students have a Microsoft Windows 10 computer with eight gigabytes of memory. We are suggesting strongly a 256 gigabyte disk storage, uh, solid state disk storage unit. If you've only got two, if you've only got uh, 128, that's going to be just fine. Uh, you'll probably be able to survive. If you've got something a little bit smaller, you may have some issues with some of the software that we have when you go to download it, depending on how large it is. Uh, we are asking that you have a webcam, speakers, and microphone. Uh, we are suggesting headphones are really, really good. You see, I'm wearing a set. You see, John's got the same thing. It drowns out the background noise, especially if you've got more people uh, around, your, uh, around your household or wherever you're learning from. Uh, it really helps you to focus. Uh, if you have less of a computer or you have a Mac or a Chromebook, we are not recommending that you have those. But if that's all you have, we can still support you. And we'll talk about that later on with connectivity. Um, we are suggesting as a minimum for internet connectivity that you have five megabits per second for yourself. So as an example, myself and my wife, my wife teaches at a local university here online. And in our particular case, we have 40 megabits. And so we have more than that five megabit between the two of us that's fully dedicated to it. I'm going to turn it to John just as a, a note. John has a larger family and some younger uh, uh, children at home. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about your connectivity just so that they get an idea of that? Sure. So, so I'm similar. Um, basically live in a, a city here in, um, in the Niagara region. Um, my internet's actually a little bit faster than John's, but I have um, a, a family of six with a lot of YouTube and a lot of um, Netflix and streaming applications and that. And um, uh, no issues whatsoever, typically with any of the tools that we're proposing, whether it be Zoom here that we're using or video conferencing. Um, but th that is really where it becomes important. You need to understand what else is going on in your environment. 
Uh, five meg is adequate, even if there are a few other users in the, in the, in the house. Um, but as that number drops, it's really going to affect your, your experience. It doesn't mean you can't um, utilize our, our, our lab tools or you know, be on a conference call. It just makes it a little bit more likely that you're going to have challenges or things are going to work slower. So um, to kind of put the stamp on it, my internet connection is actually 100 meg. So I'm in very good shape that way. Um, but when I look at my monthly bill and see how much um, internet my, my family consumes, it's kind of shocking too. So I think I need that much just to be productive. Um, yes, Howard. Hey guys, I was just wondering, do you happen to have a link of some tool on the internet that students can use to check how fast their internet is? Yes, so just my, oh, go my, ahead, John. I was gonna say my preferred link, uh, the one that typically my team uses is actually very simple. They can just type in www.fast.com and it does a running calculation kind of repeatedly if you leave it running on, on your connection. I can even demo that a bit later when we're doing the other demos. So one of the suggestions I make is if you have a large number of people that are in your household that you try to time shift a little bit so that you're the only one on if you're having some trouble with uh, what they call latency or jitter where you see your screen kind of flash a little bit if you're watching videos, you may have to postpone watching those videos uh, till a later time or ask other people in your household uh, to not use the internet. Anyways, I don't want to be I don't want to beat us up too much, everyone, right now. If you're connected to us, obviously you have internet and you have internet connectivity. So account access. You have been given when you registered a username and password from the college. Uh, I know it sounds crazy to say, but you got to remember your password. Uh, otherwise, you'll be contacting us uh, quite continually to reset it. Uh, it does take a little bit of time for you to contact us, for us to contact you back, for us to verify who you are, uh, to be able to speed up that process. If you always keep remembering your password, that will make the process much, much easier. Uh, we've tried to give you a single resource to be able to connect to, and that's the portal. And you can reach that at Portal NC dot niagara college dot ca we've given you the link here that will once you sign in with your user code and your password that will give you connections to pretty much everything that you need at the college it takes you into blackboard which is our learning management system there are links there for office uh for the microsoft office 365 and microsoft teams there are connections for apps anywhere and we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Uh, there's connections to the registration system or any other scheduling system that you may need to get into. There's also a lot of information about student uh, for students and a lot of news information that's going on at the college. So uh, if there's some big announcement, we can usually put it up on the portal for you. Um, there's also one more thing that if you are going to be in your cases, you're not going to be coming on campus, but you may want to also download. We have a Niagara College mobile app. Uh, if you go onto the app stores, either Android, either the Google one or Apple, you can download if you look up Niagara College mobile app. Uh, you will be able to sign on and there's a lot of information there and a lot of links that you can use on your phone also. If you or when you're actually coming to attend the college in person, uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to utilize that app, uh, more so once you're actually here in Canada and here in Niagara. Uh, anything to add on that, John? Uh, I don't think so, John. Okay. So academic software access. So I've already talked about this thing called Apps Anywhere. Essentially, what Apps Anywhere is, is a piece of technology that we put in place now, and it allows you to be able to click on some icons that have academic software tied to them, and it will download it to your computer. So you actually get a copy 
And not just are we giving you a copy of the actual software, we're actually in some cases loading up the entire environment as if you were sitting at a computer on the college campus. So we are emulating our computer lab environment for you one piece of software at a time. So uh, it, you must have an internet connection to be able to download this and it may take a couple of extra seconds to be able to get it down uh, the first time. After that, when you click on it, it'll be as fast as your computer and it has to just touch base on the internet once with the college to be able to say, yes, I am fully, I am a student at the college and I am licensed to use this piece of software. So you do have to have an internet connection to be able to use the software, at least to start it up, but you should have a great experience. Like I said, it should be emulating the uh, college environment. John's gonna do a demo in a second. The second piece of software that we have, not just will you be able to download some of these academic applications that you need, but we also have another piece of software for some of our programs where instead of downloading the app, you'll actually make a connection to the college and a very specific college computer. So with this product called Splashtop, you're actually gonna do what's called a remote desktop connection and you're going to connect up and utilize the computer at the college, but you're going to be doing it remotely. Uh, for programs such as gaming programmer analyst or some uh, graphic designs, or if you're taking any of the dental programs, we just can't let you download that software onto your desktop so you can work remotely. We have to make you come to us to actually access that software. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John and he can do a, a demo. So I'll stop sharing. I think I have to do that, John. There you go. Okay, so um, I'm just going to get my screen shared here. It will take me a couple seconds. Uh, hopefully I am sharing now. And uh, we're going to keep the demo fairly brief, um, just so it's clean and, and, and understandable. Um, it is actually pretty straightforward, pretty simple as, as I'm going to demonstrate. And I do want to show you sort of the way that we would recommend everybody access it. Um, so I'm just closing those and I'm going to start from scratch. And really, as John mentioned before, everything we do, we want to kind of leverage Portal NC. And Portal NC does have a couple names, but typically there it is there. That's Portal NC. And this is what you would be seeing when you go into there. So, and we've pre-pinned the two most useful resources typically we find for students. Um, Blackboard has been around for some time, but Apps Anywhere is um, a newer endeavor for us um, uh, with the current times and that to make the lab software available. And that's where we're going to start. So everyone, when they log into the portal, should see these. Now, to be clear, Apps Anywhere is not, has not been made available to students yet. It's still um, being sort of cleaned up and and made sure that it's uh, in perfect working order. Um, but I can certainly demonstrate it here and faculty have been given access to do their testing and, and be prepared with it. Um, but basically, uh, you will note that I had to log in. Um, so there again is where the password comes in and you will find when you try to go to Portal NC, while for me being on a college computer, I was able to just get right into there, you will have to log in at that point. And then um, you can basically launch from there. So. I'm going to launch a, a quick application here just to kind of show the concept. Uh, maybe I'll do two of them. And then we're going to jump into the second part of the demo, which is Splashtop. So really, this is to reflect how easy and simple it is. I'm launching an application called Audacity. And there's this little cloud paging player that kind of manages that process. So think of Apps Anywhere as an app store, much like you'd have on your phone or your tablet uh, or your Mac computer or whatever. Um, Windows doesn't typically conform so much to the App Store mentality, but they're starting to move that way as well. So this is your, your sort of App Store um, where you do most of your work. And here you can see that after a, a reasonably brief delay, uh, a program that's useful for editing audio files and things like that called Audacity was loaded and it was literally installed down to my computer. 
You can see right now by clicking my start menu, I now have Audacity installed. And once installed, and just to kind of show the concept John had mentioned before that the first time you launch it, there's a little bit of a delay because it's actually installing. It just installs in a bit different way than if you had installed it yourself. But when I relaunch it the second time, I can actually do it through my start menu. And you can see the splash screens already come up. And within a couple seconds, we have Audacity up and running. So probably three to five times quicker than when you launched it before. And the way we're positioning it is while I launched that through my start menu, you can certainly do that. We're suggesting that every time, just come back to the Apps Anywhere page, find the app you're interested in, and you can launch it from here just the same as I launched it from the start menu. So this kind of gives you a single point to find all of your academic software. And in this case, it tucked in behind my window. Um, and one other little tidbit worth sharing, there is a favorites section here. So I don't remember exactly what I have in my favorites. I already have Audacity in my favorites, but checking the little box here, the little star gives you the ability to flag some of these apps. Because as you can see, the list of apps is uh, 135 and growing. We still have some that we're packaging. Um, but really, uh, you may not see all of those. It's going to depend on which programs you're in, but you also have quite good search capability in that. So as long as you know what you're looking for, it's easy to find. Otherwise, you can scroll through and you should have access to all the software that's required for, for your program. Now, John did mention it briefly as well, but not every application is available to be loaded off campus to your computers. Um, certain applications like the Adobe Creative Suite and some of the others cannot, um, our licensing doesn't allow us to extend those through apps anywhere. So I see it here because I'm on a college computer. And this is a scenario where um, the splash top application I'll show you next comes into play. You may have to remote in to access these. Um, and John had also mentioned certain other ones like our GIS products, or I think it's at the very top, um, ACL. I'm not gonna launch it because I'm not convinced I have the full uh, capability I need, but ACL is a very special piece of software used in our law clerk program. And it requires um, network shares, access to SQL servers and things that in a typical world you would not get access to remotely. But we have it configured such that um, by installing our VPN device, which many of you should be familiar uh, with VPN, virtual private network, which would be another item that some students would install. By installing VPN and then clicking uh, the ACL link, it will map a network drive. It will gain you access to those internal resources. So you can run that piece of software right from your home computer. Um, whereas in you know, most other scenarios, you would have no choice but to either be on site or potentially use the other mechanisms. So again, these are not necessarily apps everyone needs. In most cases, it's going to be as simple as, oh, I need to access 7-Zip. You click it and 7-Zip is a very small application. So it loaded very quickly and away you go. Uh, and when you're done, it's literally as simple as closing your browser window. And then the next time you need to access or you start working on your, your coursework and that again, you would just come back to the portal, go back to Apps Anywhere and you're set to go. And because you've already used those applications once, they should already be on your computer and the launch time should be fast, essentially as quick as your, your local computer is able to handle it. So that's Apps Anywhere, and we are also going to do a, a demonstration on our, essentially it's remote control software to bring you directly into our lab environment. So I'm actually, I thought I was, had this closed. Um, but the product is called Splashtop. And the way it works is you will be sent an invitation uh, closer to the school term. This one has not been released either. But you will get an invitation um, to basically log into the web page, and you will be assigned to groups of computers. So in this particular case, I'm, assume, uh, I'm assigned to what we're calling right now CPA for Computer Programmer Analyst and Gaming. Now these are specialized computers. They're very high end. Um, some of the software is actually available to be used at home. And some students with high end, and we mean high end computers, would be able to do that, uh, whether it's through Apps Anywhere or other means. But because of the high performance requirements, we're offering up those entire labs to those programs for the students to be able to log into them directly. And it's as simple as when you 
uh, open up the group, you'll see the list of computers available. In the case of this one here, there is actually a student on it. Now, today there's not anybody on campus, so this student has probably recently disconnected from that machine, but I still can't connect to that machine. As long as there's a name attached to it, you cannot do anything with that machine. So the idea would be you pick a free machine, you click the connect button, and you'll see just how easy this is to connect. And at this point, this is actually, um, for those who are not at all familiar with remote control software, this is actually the, the computer screen of the computer sitting in our, in this case, it's uh, Simco 302 lab. And I just have to log into it, same as I would if I was in the lab. And uh, I, partially we picked these computers because they are the fastest, pretty much the fastest we have. So login experience, everything is as quick as it can be. Um, they also have a wealth of software on here, but I wanna demonstrate again how Apps Anywhere plays into um, those students who are gonna be accessing this way. So at this point, I've now gotten to the desktop of this machine um, and I can access their start menu and all the software that's on there. In this case, I think I'm just gonna launch one of the local applications here. We'll pick uh, Adobe Illustrator. And so this again is accessing directly into the lab computer and all the software that's on there. The other thing while we're waiting for that that's very useful to show and it's something we would highly recommend is anytime you log into one of our lab computers, it automatically will map your OneDrive. Um, so along with your, your college account, you get access to the Microsoft Office suite. Uh, and one of those pieces is OneDrive. So by having that map when you connect to the lab, and if you also use that at home, you'll have access to the same uh, soft, sorry, not software, but the same files and working projects and things that you're doing. Um, and in our lab environment, when you log out, nothing is saved for you. So the idea being save frequently and use OneDrive whenever you're working through Splashtop in one of our labs, and if you do the same at home, your files will always be available to you, whichever one of our lab computers you connect to. So at this point, um, again, this is the local copy of um, Adobe Illustrator. I'm not gonna log into it. It was just to reflect that I can launch the software and away it goes. Having said that, let's close that quickly. Um, we are still recommending and what you're going to find in many of the labs. So for the students who are coming in on um, a Chromebook, as we identified earlier, or a, a computer that's not quite able to run some of the software, um, we're still recommending that Apps Anywhere is your place to go. So if you click the start menu of the machine you've connected to and you don't find the software you need, you can use Apps Anywhere on any of our labs, lab computers to gain access to the same software. Um, same process, I have to log in. And in this case, we haven't finished prepping this lab, so it actually has to install a few little components. And this is what you would be see that seeing the very first time you launch Apps Anywhere at home. It needs to install that cloud paging player, which is very quick. Quicker here because again, we're on campus, very high speed internet and things to accommodate all the students. Um, and when that finishes, I can just click done. It does this little validation. And the validation, um, and you do require an internet connection when you're using this, but this validation is just to make sure you're, you're a valid user, the, light, the software is licensed properly, um, that, you, that it hasn't received an update or something that we would trigger for you guys to, um, to have to recache it. And I'm just gonna quickly launch two apps here. Um, Express Scribe is one. So Express Scribe is, um, it's for uh, office automation program uh, for doing uh, note taking and, and transcription. And you can see this software was not previously on the machine, but it loads up very quickly. And um, being a small application, it loads extremely quickly. And just like we had said before, now that it's on the machine, um, it should theoretically load even quicker. And I'm gonna do one additional app in a second. So loads at the power and at the speed of the, the machine we're dealing with. Um, so I just want to find 
one more, Camtasia, which is a little bit bigger application, and I'm going to let that one launch. And it will take a couple seconds for this one because, again, it's a bigger application, a little bit more um, uh, of a footprint, and, and it'll take longer. And in particular, if you had access to this one from home, it's going to take a little bit longer to download over your internet connection than it does here. This one here should be another 10 seconds or so. We should have it loaded. And here you can see it's basically almost there. The splash screen has come up and you just have to be a little bit patient while this first load is happening. And then as we've described after that, subsequent launches, everything loads very quickly. And in our using Splash Top and our on-campus environment and that, these applications will download and launch very quickly and can be done essentially at the beginning of your class. So, so once again, now that that's actually down there and on the machine, I'm hoping we're going to see it in the start menu. And you'll see very quickly how much faster it loads on the second launch. And just to reiterate, and this is sort of the end of the demo here, but just to reiterate, the labs, the lab computers, the big difference from a home computer is we use a technology on here called Deep Freeze, which essentially locks down uh, the state of the computer. So when I go to leave Splash Top, I actually have to come down here and I'm going to restart the machine. And when I restart the machine and then just close the Splash Top window, that machine is essentially going to be completely wiped and put back to the position that it was in before I connected to it in the first place, waiting and ready for the next student to get on there. So no files are retained. None of those apps you've downloaded or anything you've done on there is retained. Um, same as if you have been on onto a college campus in the past, it, it's the same behavior that, uh, that we have if you're walking up physically to the labs. So um, th that is, again, the big reason for needing to save your files regularly, because if you do lose access to that computer or you reboot it before you are done or whatever, there will be nothing left from your, your previous session. So use OneDrive, uh, save your files frequently, and um, other than that, the environment should work just like any other computer you would use. And Howard, that uh, I think is the end of what I have to show. Okay, if you want to just unshare, John. Great information, John. Sorry, I've been I've been so wrapped up in trying to respond to all of these great questions that are coming out. Uh, is there anything else to add? And then, yes. if not, I can move into other things. So, John Levy. There's a few Levy. more. Uh, <laughs> there, hey, no problem. There's I'm a few to work more. On it. There's a few more slides here uh, to go through. Uh, do you have up my? Do you have the slide that says Academic Software Access? Just want to make sure. Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. So. John mentioned it, the last point at the very bottom is, uh, under Apps Anywhere, we don't give you Microsoft Office. We are signed up for Microsoft Office and we have a campus agreement as well as fully integrated to uh, Microsoft to be able to download all the Office 365 suite of software, including OneDrive that John mentioned. So you can always go to www.office.com, sign on with your college email and password, and you can download and get all of that software downloaded onto your computer. Uh, the full suite of Microsoft is pretty much available to you. And as John mentioned, OneDrive is also available. OneDrive basically is a, a terabyte of disk storage for students in the cloud. So you can, uh, everything that you save in our labs, we do have integrated back so that you can save it up to uh, OneDrive if you're signed in. And then every single time you sign in, if you save to the cloud, you'll be able to access that data and be able to anywhere in the world, whether you're here or you're at home or you're owed at your internet cafe and learning, you'll still be able to get to all of your files, uh, regardless of what computer you're actually using at the time. So it's very important to uh, uh, download that software and get used to using uh, 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 OneDrive as your storage uh, location. So as John kind of alluded to a little bit, uh, what if you don't have the minimum computer requirements? Uh, we can't help you if you don't have internet. So if the internet goes down you're, until you have internet again, uh, there's nothing we can do. At the college, we do have uh, dual 
uh, internet feeds and they're very high speed. We have 10 gigabits per second coming into the institution. We also use a lot of cloud technology such as Microsoft and Blackboard are in the cloud. They have very large internet feeds. They don't usually go down. Microsoft, I think, has gone down a couple of times in the last year. Uh, it does happen. Uh, I, I, we, we're not responsible for them. They do the best they possibly can, but uh, with workloads in this pandemic, there have been some interesting situations, but they are so infrequent that it's usually not us uh, in most cases. So like I said, unfortunately, there is no substitute for a lack or poor internet. You have to have internet to connect to us. Uh, for students with older Windows 10 and they don't meet those minimum standards that we have, as long as you have a webcam or you have a microphone and, and headphones, stuff should work. Uh, your mileage may vary. I can't guarantee that you're going to not have problems, but for the most part, if you've got a Windows 10 computer, you can survive. You might just have a slow experience. For those with Windows 7, which there are still some out there, um, it is, and speaking from cy a cybersecurity standpoint, it is a security issue. Uh, if you have an older Windows uh, operating system, we do recommend that you do upgrade your computer, but you can, again, in almost all cases, uh, you can still uh, have a reasonable experience or at least connect on to the college through Splashtop and utilize the software remotely. The same as John mentioned for Apple or Chromebook, you would use Splashtop, connect to one of the uh, computers in the pool, and be working at the college remotely where you have a Windows-based uh, computer to actually use. Um, I'm just saying, please note this won't be ready. John did mention we will be posting that and putting out emails uh, to you as students as soon as this is all available. And we're gonna do that a little closer to the beginning of the school year. Um, next piece, uh, the IT service desk. And if I miss anything here, uh, John will certainly fill it in for me. But uh, the college IT website uh, is ITS, which stands for Information Technology Services. Uh, its.niagaracollege.ca. There is a website with uh, a very large amount of documentation. There's frequently asked questions. There's links to everything that we've talked about today. Uh, you, there's also links to our help desk. There's email links. Um, you can go there and enter a service request or you can email us at itservicedesk at niagaracollege.ca. We're also working on a chat service that'll be announced soon. Uh, what we are asking you to do if you connect to us either through the chat service or through a, um, uh, or through the college website or email, please, please give us a telephone number that we can call you. We don't care where you are in the world, we will call you. If you want us, because of a time difference, especially for international, if you want us to try to pick a different time, we can try to accommodate, but we only do, we're not gonna be up in the middle of the night being able to call you back. So we'll have to make it reasonable, but we can give you a phone call back because it's so much easier for speaking with you, uh, but we will try to resolve it via chat or email back and forth, but again, please give us the phone number. It really makes a big difference in how fast we can respond to you. John, do you have anything more on the service desk itself? I, I thought I'd just mention that, um, yeah, the biggest reason in, in many cases to, to need to phone or to have that phone number is when it's an account related issue. So John had mentioned uh, several times at the beginning about how important your password is. If you know your username and password, a lot of times we can help you remotely. Um, typically, though, if we need to um, confirm who you are, exchange confidential information, um, you know, to validate who you are, things like that, we only do that through the phone. Uh, and at the beginning of term, a lot of your challenges may be that way. I'm not seeing this type of information. I can't see my timetable. 
um, or I can't access systems. Those are the types of items where, again, we're not likely to be able to go uh, to full resolution over chat or over email. We're going to have to touch base with you directly and verify that you are who you say you are. Uh, in a lot of cases, those account related or I can't access type questions are not as simple as, oh, this is what it is, we fix it. We have to dig a little deeper. So that's where that having the callback number and potentially moving to a phone call instead of continuing through chat becomes especially important, typically at the beginning of the term. Later in the term, your issues will be a little bit different and the chat service um, may be able to resolve uh, or just a simple ticket resolution gets emailed out an hour or two later and things are fixed. But in the short term, chat is what we're, we're hoping on and primarily to establish the connection so that we can uh, address your support um, immediately rather than having to wait for a response sometime later. Okay, thank you, John. And one other note, uh, if it is account related, we do need your student number, uh, not just the phone number to be able to reach you back because that'll be our primary way of determining who exactly you are rather than just by your name. So with that, I think we're at the question point. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing at this point, uh, uh, Howard, just because, uh, uh, this up on the screen is a lot of screen, uh, and I'll go back to our regular uh, uh, regular Zoom session. Great. Well, thank you so much, John. John, uh, what a wonderful session and very, very informative. We do have a, a large number of questions. We've got about eight outstanding right now, and I'm just going to pop into them and uh, ask you guys to field a few of them. So the first question is from Bakshish Singh, uh, and he's asking, is it mandatory to use campus computers? No, it's not mandatory. Uh, you don't have to connect onto the campus computers, but you will have to connect to the campus services to be able to get to the applications. Uh, as John was showing, and let's not worry about Audacity as an example, but he was showing you that application. If you're in your course and you needed to use that software, you're not going to be, you're not going to go and buy it. You're going to connect to our resources and pull that application down. And now you're using your local computer and you won't have any problem. There are very few courses and, and very few um, uh, times when you're going to have to connect to the college's computers remotely. There are some courses that you just can't get to the software any other way, and you will have to make that connectivity. Or if you don't have the minimum requirements with a computer for you to be able to use apps anywhere. We've tried to bundle everything up for you. Uh, to help you not have to use college resources. But like I said, your mileage may vary and you're just going to have to see uh, when you get to sign on whether that's going to be your case. John, do you want to add to that? No, I think you've covered it well, John. Okay. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Okay, next one I have is uh, students are logging into the MyNC section to be able to select their timetable and they're seeing a whole bunch of timetable blocks. They're a little bit confused about which one they should choose. Now I know this is typically a registrar's question. Uh, I can field this one, but do either of you have anything that you'd like to cover off on that? Okay. So I haven't been on that screen in a long time. I, already, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to okay. mess them up. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. So uh, timetable blocks simply relate to the uh, series of courses and instructors. Uh, and if you're doing uh, synchronous classes or if you're doing on-campus classes, the time or schedule that you'll be doing those classes. Uh, so if you're doing purely online, you could really select any of the blo timetable blocks that are available to you. Uh, and because it's asynchronous learning, which means that the classes are pre-recorded or inserted in there and that you have the option of doing those uh, classes at any time of day, uh, it really doesn't affect you very much. The only thing it does is it 
indicates who is your instructor. Uh, when you're here back here on campus in January, uh, that will actually determine what time your classes are. So that's what the timetable blocks are. Okay. The next one, just trying to get uh, into some of the ITS ones. So I will ask uh, any of the students that are responding in the question and answer section, uh, please don't include your personal information like phone numbers, uh, email addresses, student identification numbers. Uh, those are your private information. Uh, what you can do is you can either email IT service desk at niagaracollege.ca. Uh, if you also want to, you can send us a private message in chat. You can select uh, John Hilbing in this case when it's about your account, and you can send him a private message and include your phone number in there, and he'll be able to see it and respond to you, but that way it's not broadly out there for everyone to see. Um, Let's see here. So Howard, so I, see a, I see a question from Jonathan asking about uh, how to connect OneDrive when using the computer in the lab through Splashtop. Um, so we did touch on that one a little bit, but just to cover it uh, a little in a little different way. So OneDrive, your Niagara College version of OneDrive will automatically connect when you remote into any lab machine through Splashtop. Um, the Windows-based computers, it happens completely automatic. You literally just launch the file explorer 10 seconds or so after you're logged in, and you will have access again to your Niagara College OneDrive. Um, in our Mac labs, and uh, I don't think we've covered that, but graphics design uh, in particular, as well as a couple broadcasting courses, leverage Mac computers on campus, those will be available to those specific classes as well. And OneDrive will map there as well. You have to launch it a little bit more manually, but it will be there. And if the question is directed around personal OneDrive, for those who may have their own personal OneDrive account, that can be accomplished. Um, again, the, the Niagara College one maps automatically, but you can still go to the web version of your personal OneDrive and download files and do whatever with the personal. But again, as it pertains to college, you know, academic use or whatever, uh, you're getting a free terabyte for as long as you're a student here at the college. And we would suggest you try to keep that there just because it'll be a little bit more seamless. And you can actually use the Niagara College OneDrive on your home computer beside a personal OneDrive account if you have one. I do that all the time as well. And that way you can, you know, have access to your college material at home. And then when you go to the lab, it's just automatically there and waiting for you, but your personal stuff does not then get pulled down to the college computer. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, John, that does. That's great. Uh, we have another question from uh, Rupinderji Kaur. Uh, she states that her device is not supporting some of the applications. What does she have to do? So I think that the question is really, if there's a problem being able to use any of the college applications on their computer, uh, how do they resolve that? Who do they reach out to and, and what are some of the common things that, that people can do to resolve them themselves? And then where, when the sh should they be reaching out to our service desk team? So I think the, um, there's probably a couple answers to that and it needs just a little bit more information perhaps about the type of challenge and what type of computer they're using at home. Um, the simplest answer or the most direct way, uh, especially if something happens sort of in term or whatever, would be to use Splashtop and get to one of the on-campus college computers. Um, there you're going to have, again, our environment, clean, um, you know, theoretically problem-free or free of any problems you're experiencing at home. But if the intention is more to, to resolve issues with your home computer, um, I would suggest that is a, a point where you would first of all try the Apps Anywhere version if that's not what you are using. And if you continue to have problems, then you would reach out to the IT service desk. And we would need to first identify if your computer is powerful enough um, based on the specs that we saw before. And if there's some underlying factor 
that's causing a conflict. Like maybe you have an older version, and this is just one example, but um, if you had an older version of the same software, like AutoCAD 2018, and now you're trying to leverage 2019 or 2020, um, there might be a, uh, an easily fixable answer. Um, but again, it requires a little bit more digging. Um, so a call to the service desk would be required or a, or a chat session. But again, your immediate fix um, from this standpoint would be to use Splashtop and remote into a, a lab computer so that you could at least complete whatever work you needed to for your classes. Great, thank you. So from that, I'm taking it that if they have uh, immediate challenges with running the software on their personal desktop, we do have the option of Splashworks where their desktop connects remotely to our computers, which are powerful enough to run the software. If it's not that kind of issue, if it's, if it's a personal desktop issue, it's something that they'll have to get resolved in their home country. And for anything else, they can reach out to service desk uh, to be able to get resolved. Yeah, and just a note, Howard, on that. Uh, we do have software for remote support. So we technically, we don't do an awful lot of this uh, uh, necessarily for student machines, but if there's something blocking it, our uh, technicians can actually connect onto your home computer. You'll be able to actually see that connectivity happening and you'll be able to authorize them to connect onto your computer and they can at least take a look around and potentially do some minor diagnostics. We don't get into fixing your computer, but we can spot those little tiny things that may be problematic and be able to resolve them fairly quickly or at least tell you that you're gonna to have to take it to uh, one of your local service technicians in your home country. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for clarifying all of that. Uh, we have a question from, uh, I believe it's Isel Villalobos. Uh, after studying at the college, will the OneDrive account still be available to use uh, or will they have to migrate all of their files? John, do you remember the retention uh, time for those files? Yeah, so the, I'm not 100% certain I have it perfect, but you have it for your duration at the college, and I believe uh, a period of time afterwards, but you will have to eventually give up that storage space or subscribe. Um, I believe it's around $10 Canadian. I'm not sure what it is in, in all countries, but after, after you finish uh, at Niagara College, uh, it's either a year or two years later, you will no longer have that storage space, and you will have to subscribe to a different service or you know, do what you're doing today or pay Microsoft on a monthly basis for that storage, just like you do any other applica cloud application now. Okay, great. So my understanding from that is, yes, you'll retain it for a temporary basis afterwards, but eventually it will cut off. Uh, so that temporary basis is simply to allow you enough time to migrate your files to your own personal account or to make the decision to purchase. That's after you're no longer a student at the college. So it goes on for at least a year after you leave, those files are still available to you. Correct. Excellent. Uh, I also have a question from Rajit Chandran. Uh, he says his computer has an HDD of one terabyte instead of SSD. Is that okay or does he need to set up SSD on his computer? I'm afraid I don't know what any of that yeah, means. Yeah. It's way no. too technical for me. But One of them is spinny disk, uh, and the other one is just uh, actually what they call solid state disk, so it's just a chunk of memory. So what you might have with a HDD is a hard disk drive, and usually though that's the older technology that tended to spin inside your computer. So you could actually hear it spin up and spin down. One terabyte uh, each, uh, hard disk drive should be just fine. Uh, the only thing is SSD is faster technology. And for some of these big applications, we're telling people this is the newest technologies that you could have on your computer. 
and it'll give you a faster, better experience. What people are getting used to is the applications just continue to keep getting bigger and bigger. And when you click on them, they have to actually pull that information off of the hard drive or the solid state disk and put it into memory. Old technology, which is the spinning disk, can take a little while longer to load those particular applications back up and or save data back down, depending on how large it is. With solid state technology or solid state disk, things will happen much more quickly and you'll have a faster, better experience. One isn't better than the other, but if it's really old, uh, uh, old technology, like I said, your mileage may vary and it may take a little longer. Uh, John, any other comment on that? Yeah, so I think uh, the big dependency is potentially what program of study you're in. So if you're using uh, the Autodesk products because you're in construction engineering technology or mechanical engineering technology, or if you're trying to run some of the gaming software like 3D animation type things on your home computer, then that slowness factor, like a, a spinning drive being 20 to 30% slower than an SSD is really why we stated SSD. Um, so what I would look at is your other specifications. If you meet the eight meg or sorry, eight gig, and you have an adequate Windows 10 relatively new machine, then the spinning disk is less of a factor. But if that, if your computer is five or six years old, um, you know, maybe four gigs of RAM, you may find uh, it more of a challenge to access yourself. And thus again, you may find that Splashtop becomes a, a more suitable option, at least again, for those higher end applications like AutoCAD or some of those others. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Temitope Patoki, I believe contacting us from West Africa. She's asking us, uh, she's been trying to uh, use her username to reset her password, but the counter password is incorrect and she's having trouble resetting it. So if you can just remind everybody, what do you do if you can't reset your password and you're having some trouble logging in, how do you get help? And what are the steps you should take? Do you want to take that, John, or do you want me to take the first shot? No, I can. Okay. Um, so, so in that case, you will have to contact our service desk. So that email address, itservicedesk at niagaracollege.ca. And again, don't necessarily send personally identifiable info. We need your student number and the nature of your challenge and a callback number is what I would say. And somebody should be able to get back to you um, same day. Uh, there will need to be a phone conversation so that we can verify your identity and then they will be able to help you set a password. And from that point, you should be, for, uh, should be fine. One thing we haven't mentioned, and I, I feel like this might be part of the, the discussion here, is we do have self-service password reset. And once that's set up, um, it's usually um, fairly easy for students to reset their own password. But in some cases, getting that initial configuration or setup done um, can be a little bit challenging or some struggle with it. And um, again, though, that is your big sort of saving grace after you have it up and configured and the service desk can help make sure you have that in place as part of the call as well. Great, thank you. And just for all of our international students who are east of uh, Canada, uh, so anywhere from uh, Africa, South Asia and further east, uh, please remember that the time zone difference ranges between about eight hours all the way up to 13 hours. Uh, so therefore, if you do leave a callback number when you're contacting the ITS service desk and you are in one of those countries, uh, please do make sure that you're requesting a callback between the hours of 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning. Specify that for our ITS team so they know when to call you. Uh, that way they'll be calling you at a reasonable hour. If you don't do that, we may call you at 4.30 p.m. our time, uh, which could be as late as five o'clock in the morning your time. So just trying to make sure that, that you've indicated that you need to be called early in the morning by our time. We follow Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that would be very helpful for making sure that you do pick up the phone. I know that we do run into issues sometimes where we're trying to call students back, they're not answering. and most of the time it's because you're asleep. Yeah, tell us where you are and we'll try to adapt to 
making it a reasonable time when we call uh, because we really have no idea where you are. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And, and really our service desk team is exceptional and they really do try to uh, service our students well and try to adapt to what your needs are. Uh, the next question I have, uh, again, this is another one about uh, logging in. It's from Hai Feng Long. Uh, he was trying to set up and access their NC account. They have no idea what the password is. When they're asked to reset the password, the web page came back and forth incorrectly. And so again, to reiterate what John said, uh, that's the time when you should be contacting IT service desk at niagaracollege.ca. Include your student number, a phone number, including your country code, where we can call you back, and where you are in the world or uh, Eastern Standard Time that we should be calling you back. Uh, if you are, uh, it appears Haifang is likely in East Asia. Uh, so you have to remember that we would be 12 to 13 hours behind you uh, by our time zone. Um, from Pushkar Bardwaj, uh, from where would I be able to log in on that application? Is it from anywhere? So basically, if they're logging into apps anywhere or they're logging into Splashpad, I think it was, uh, or any of our software systems, can they do that from anywhere? Are there any restrictions to how they can access it? And in some cases, in some countries, would there possibly be any barriers to them accessing uh, certain programs or software? And maybe I can take that there shouldn't be technically any reason why you can't connect from anywhere in the world as long as you have internet. However, there are a couple of countries uh, that do have restricted uh, internet uh, connectivity or that do block uh, some um, uh, websites or some content, depending on what it is. Um, in the case of China, we are working on a way to allow our students uh, that are at the college to be able to connect on and to the learning resources. It doesn't mean you'll be able to uh, bypass some of the restrictions that are imposed within that country. Uh, but we are looking to make sure that you can still have a great uh, learning experience and be able to connect up to things like Apps Anywhere and Splashtop and other technologies that you need to complete your program, um, where they may or may not be as well connected from your country. Um, in a couple of other countries, again, if you're having trouble, please email us because sometimes it isn't your, a problem with your country. It might be a problem with connectivity. It could be a problem with your own computer. Uh, getting malware on your computer is one of the largest, most problematic things for us uh, from our side. You're trying to connect to us and it's nothing that we're doing wrong. It's because your computer has, uh, uh, has malware on it that is stopping you or trying to interact with your computer in a way that it can't load the software. In those cases, uh, once we're able to diagnose it or identify it, you'll be able to take it to one of your local service uh, locations and be able to get that resolved. But like I said, in most cases, you shouldn't have a problem at all. Great, thank you, John. And uh, the timing, and, and, and just one note, uh, Howard, the timing for the particular, uh, for apps anywhere, we're hoping to be able to release it within the next week or two to students uh, and have it available because we do want people to test it before uh, we're in classes and we are getting the faculty first to look at it and make sure that, all, that we've gotten all of the applications up and available. Uh, so, and we want people to start to feel comfortable uh, with the software before they start classes. So uh, that should be available soon. Uh, and I know that puts a lot of pressure on John from that side. I'm not saying I guarantee in a week. I'm just saying we're trying as fast as we can before the beginning of the school year 
we should have that uh, uh, link alive. No, and that's great information. And so just, uh, it actually segues very well into a very important thing that our students have to keep in mind and, and start actioning. Uh, so first of all, if you have not selected your timetable, please select your timetable. You will not have access to anything really until you're enrolled in your classes. Uh, and you won't know what you need to access until you're enrolled in your classes because that's how you get your syllabus. That's how you find out what your books are, what software you need to be able to access and how you're going to access it. Um, the other part of it is uh, keeping in mind that Apps Anywhere or any of those types of services, we will always email you once they're ready. Uh, so we do expect to have that shortly, but preemptively uh, you will be able to have access before classes start to be able to test the systems. We haven't confirmed the exact day of when that's going to happen, but it will be very, very soon. And we will notify you uh, broadly uh, from the college to be able to say, you can now access these things and here's how you do it. Uh, the other really important thing, and I see lots of questions about this, and this is more related to uh, the changes in immigration that talk about approvals in principle uh, and second stage approvals and how the college is supporting our students. Uh, so, and this also relates to what you should be doing to be able to select your timetable. If you have not received your study permit approvals, but you have already applied and you're able to select your timetable, please select your timetable. If you're not sure if you're able to select your timetable, here's the main things you need to know. You need to have accepted the program that you have been uh, given an offer of admission to, and you need to have paid your fees for at least the first semester of your program. That will trigger us to move you forward so that you can select your timetable. Please be aware that if you don't receive your study permit approval and principal by September 21st, we strongly, very strongly recommend that you withdraw or defer no later than September 22nd. That's the last day to withdraw from your academic program. If you withdraw, there's only a $200 administrative fee that's associated. You'll get refunded the rest of your fees. If you defer, there are no costs to do it, and you can transfer that over to uh, January while you wait for your study permit approval and principal to happen. A lot of questions about second stage study permit approvals, and just keep in mind that our withdrawal and refund policy is that if you have been approved in principal by September 21st, and if you are refused second stage approval by November 1st, so November 1st is the due date that you have to notify us if you have been refused or not received it. If you have been refused, you will be able to apply for a deferral with no cost, or you can apply for a withdrawal and refund, and you will be refunded all of your fees, less a $200 administrative fee. So with all of that said, there's really no reason not to select your timetable, start getting prepared, start getting familiarized with your courses, with the technology, start accessing all of those resources, learning about your syllabus, start ordering your books, uh, and start connecting with our PAL mentors, which you can find on international.niagaracollege.ca. If you go into student services tab, you'll see a section called PAL mentors. You can click on that and connect with a more senior student from your program or your country uh, that will assist you in transitioning to studying online or on campus here in Canada. Um, so make sure you're doing that. Also make sure that you are going to the App Store, whether it's, uh, whether it's an Apple product or an Android product, and that you are downloading the BNC Ready app that will allow you also to connect with a variety of your classmates, access resources, connect with staff and pal mentors, uh, and help you with your transition into online learning or here at the college. Uh, so please make sure that you are picking your timetable if you're able to do so, and please be very aware of the due dates that you need uh, to know in case you are refused anything or you haven't received a response. The first due date is September 22nd that you must advise us if you need to withdraw or defer, and for second stage uh, visa, or study permit refusals, the due date is November 1st. Okay, and let me just see what other bits I, and pieces. I've got, 
I've got one here, Howard, from, uh, and I'm, I'm terrible with names, like my name can't be pronounced properly. So uh, Vesheli, I think, is how you, is that reasonable, Howard? Did I get close to it? Uh, it's probably Vashali. Vashali is a name okay. from southern India, uh, Kerala, and it's my aunt's name. So my See, aunt is I from get, India, and her name is Vashali. So welcome, Vashali. I get to, I get to learn. <laughs> so when will we know what software we need uh, to access for our specific courses? So when you're actually in the course and there is a course syllabus for each one of the courses and it does lay out all of the software that you'll need, uh, your individual instructor will go over that usually in the first class uh, if they haven't asked you to pre-read that ahead of time. So you don't have to load software usually ahead of time. Uh, for any of these courses. Um, there was also a previous question, and I'm sorry I can't remember the person's name, but they were asking about are all classes done on Zoom or on um, uh, Blackboard. They, If they are going to be synchronous courses, Blackboard actually has a, uh, a product called Blackboard Collaborate. Again, it's available off of your, uh, uh, your portal. Um, Blackboard Collaborate is being used as well as Teams. I don't think an awful lot of courses are being taught on Zoom themselves. We're using Microsoft Teams and Collaborate most of the time. And it's up to the individual instructors whether they're recording their sessions or not, um, or whether they'll allow you to record their sessions. So some of them may be synchronous, some of them may be pre-recorded. So your mileage may vary, and again, it's course by course, and you'll have to check in with your individual instructor on how that course is actually being delivered. But all the software that you'll need and all the links that you'll need will be provided to you uh, on Blackboard. Well, and that's a, that's a great plug for next week, John. Yeah. So next week, everybody who's here, um, just keep in mind that next Friday, we're gonna have John and John back again. And we're going to have three of our academic uh, associate deans and deans uh, here to be able to do a live interview and panelist session about what does online learning look like at Niagara College. Uh, so by combining both of those areas, you'll be able to ask about how do instructors teach online? What kind of software do they use? Uh, as well as have the support of John and John from our, uh, from our information technology services uh, division to be able to talk about how technology works in that environment and what kinds of supports are there. So you'll be able to really see that in context. So uh, if you're free next Friday, uh, please make sure that you've taken a look at the links that were sent to you. It would be in the same email that was sent to advise you about this session. Uh, it'll also be on the BNC Ready app and advertised through there. Uh, but please make sure that you register and sign up for that because it'll be really important for you to be able to get comfortable with online learning at Niagara College. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. Um, Howard. Just check. Yep. I see one question. Looks like it's been asked a couple times. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not great with names either, but uh, Jash and Preet Singh uh, was asking a couple times, I believe, about um, what do you do if your, your hard drive doesn't quite meet that 256 gig or 128 gigs of space and in this case he's saying he has about 30 gigs free um, so there's probably two answers to that uh, one is again depends a fair bit on what program you're in and how much software and how many like what types of files you need to deal with um, 30 gigs is probably not enough without taking some types of measures so uh, he had mentioned getting a, an external hard drive. Um, an external hard drive could, could work for your working files, like you could set up your OneDrive to store the files there directly. But if you need to use apps anywhere to download a significant number of software, again, if you're in a more technical program where you're bringing down um, you know, big applications like an AutoCAD product or a GIS product or gaming, 30 gig will probably get used very quickly and you'll find yourself having to remove to maintain enough space to keep going. Um, again, I would suggest if you're that low on disk space, then splash top and remoting into lab computers for some of your work would be uh, probably a better option. Download through apps anywhere the stuff you need most 
and then use Splash Top kind of infrequently when you need some of the other apps would be my suggestion, or look into potential of getting a larger hard drive. Okay, and I think also the one of the other options would be take a look at your computer and the apps that you have on there and the software you have on there and determine whether or not you really need them. So if you've got a large number of video game apps or things like that that are not necessary to your study, uh, really evaluate whether or not you need those on your laptop and clear space on your laptop as well. Uh, that will hopefully save you a little bit of money and effort in terms of having to buy additional products to support you. And it will uh, decrease any of the risks of, of having to remote in by splash top, um, especially when we're dealing with things like brownouts. Uh, many of our countries do uh, have brownouts and splash top. Uh, your ability to use splash top will be limited by brownouts. So that's when you really want to be able to download those applications directly onto your computer. So just making sure you have the right amount of space, uh, you're set up for success. Okay. Guys, do you see any more questions here related to ITS? Uh, please note, guys, that we do have um, Paul Kelly and, and uh, other members of our team that will help you to answer some of your immigration questions and, and repeat what I've said about the deferrals and refund process. Uh, so if they have been answered, just stay online. Don't worry, they will get to you to make sure that those questions are answered. Uh, but specifically on ITS questions. Uh, we have Christy May Dianco who is saying that she feels that her problem would be an unstable network. And so I guess we probably need a little bit more information from you, Christy, about what do you mean by an unstable network? Is that that you are, uh, well, actually I'll leave it to John and John to be able to ask, what does an unstable network mean and what kind of, um, what kind of things should she be informing us of so that we can give her a proper answer? Well, it, your mileage may vary in so many different ways. Uh, if, if you think you're going to get disconnected, uh, there's, there's two kinds of instability. There's uh, the instability that you keep getting disconnected. If you get disconnected and you're in a synchronous uh, meeting like this, then you're completely interrupted and you're going to miss content uh, if you're having that delivered to you. If it's a video you're watching, Obviously, you can go back, just make another connection and move forward. Um, there's also the other problem that uh, can happen just because of distance. If you think about it, you don't have a perfect connection between where you are as a user and where the content information is. It could be bouncing all over the place throughout the world to be able to get to you. And we're talking in some cases going literally around the world uh, uh, or halfway around the world to be able to get back to us. And if you've seen some of the internet connectivity, you could be traveling the entire length of the world to get back to us, depending on how those little packets actually travel between uh, 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 you guys and us. Um, if you have that and those packets get slowed down, it produces what's called jitter in video. Uh, it also produces latency where you'll see the message, but you can't get back to the person in a reasonable amount of time. So you'll see those pauses where people will talk over top of one another. And part of that is because of latency uh, and being able to connect together. So there's a couple of different kind of issues you don't have enough internet connectivity or just the distance and the time to travel that distance can produce uh, kind of intermittent uh, issues with your connectivity. As I kind of mentioned at the beginning, there is no substitute for good internet. Uh, uh, we have had students even locally here that can't get connectivity from their house so what they do when they have to watch a video uh, or they have to participate in a class, they'll go to a coffee shop because it's got really good, um, or a cafe of some kind because it's got really good internet connectivity and they'll participate in those classes that are 
synchronous or in real time back and forth at that cafe and then they'll go back home where their internet is not perfect but at least they can kind of work their way through uh, and kind of fight their way through uh, uh, the material that they have to deal with. But again, it's, it's kind of spotty. If you don't have good internet, you're going to have to find it at least for some of those uh, 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 programs that are delivered in real time. John, any other uh, uh, notes you would want to add to that? I think it's, um... The, the, probably the cleanest thing I could say is we've been on a conference call now for about an hour and a half. And if you've had reasonably good success in not having that jitter effect or dropping and whatnot through this hour and a half, then I would say your conferencing needs. So working with your instructors, even in terms of synchronous classes is probably fine. Um, Splashtop, the, the second tool we talked about is a little bit susceptible to stability. Um, if you get disconnected very briefly, it will reconnect you, it will do some stuff, but there you, you need a, a fairly reliable connection. Apps Anywhere, again, downloads the software and you can run it local. So again, on that principle of if you manage this meeting for an hour and a half without really having challenges, you're probably gonna be okay with your internet connection. However, if you are struggling to stay connected, not hearing the audio properly, not seeing the video properly, um, then it could be challenging to participate. And as John said, you may have to look for an alternate uh, location for some of, your, um, some of your coursework. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm just checking in a quick scan for any more ITS related questions. I'll ask that you both stay on for a little bit longer as we may have some of those pop up. But we do have a couple burning questions, of course, from an international perspective that have arisen. A lot of them have to do with traveling to Canada. And when can I travel to Canada, especially if my course is completely online, um, even though I'm starting in the fall. Uh, so I want to be able to clarify some of those right away for you so that you don't have that burning question. Um, right now, there is a travel ban or a travel restriction in Canada that limits the ability of people to be able to enter the country. <clears throat> and this limitation or this restriction also applies to international students. So the only students who can come to Canada right now <clears throat> are students who have study permit approvals um, that were given on or before March 18th and <clears throat> have an essential need to be in Canada or a what they call a non-discretionary need to be in Canada, which simply means that you don't have a choice. You must be in Canada in order to uh, do your studies. Now, Niagara College uh, currently uh, is not confident that internet connectivity, because we can't verify it ourselves, uh, is a sufficient reason for us to be able to provide a supporting letter, but on-campus studies is. Now, all of our courses we're expecting to be able to deliver on campus as of January. Uh, but of course, that is depending on travel restrictions. That's depending on any sort of health uh, concerns that may arise. And so we'll take our, our lead from the government. Uh, but we are currently working uh, both as a sector, as a post-secondary sector across Ontario, uh, as well as as a college to be able to support our students and being able to arrive in Canada. We'll have some more information on that in the coming weeks, uh, probably late September, uh, to be able to advise students what their next steps are in preparing to come and join us to start their studies in January. Uh, and that will, of course, include various types of support, uh, which we'll define later as we figure out exactly what supports are needed in that context at that time. So we are working steadily towards that, and we're just doing some consultations at the moment. So we will be up, uh, updating students soon. But of course, our hope is that you will be here joining us on campus. We'll be able to greet you, say hello, shake your hand, uh, and welcome you personally to the college and make sure that you can do so safely. Uh, so that's one of the big ones. Uh, the other one is about, here's a technology one, and it's really related to when they log into MyNC and they're, they're trying to get support. Um, 
they're asking where did they insert their mobile number when they're in my MC. So I, I think that has to do with if they log an ITS ticket. Right in the email, uh, Howard, when they're actually logging the ticket, put it right on the ticket. That is a secured pathway to us uh, that they can put their callback number right on the ticket. So my name is such and such, I live in such, or I am located in such and such a place, and here's my phone number. Then put your message onto it. And that way we have it available to be able to reach back to you and we know where you are as far as time zones are concerned. Would it be possible, this is kind of an add-on, but would it be possible to do a share screen and demonstrate how you log an ITS ticket? John, do you have access to it? Easier than probably I do. Unless he vanished on me. And then I might end up doing it. And you know, do you know how long ago it was since I put a ticket in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not getting it. Be, Mr. Being, Chief Information Officer, I know for yeah, you. Being, you being just sent an head, email. <laughs> yeah, being the head of IT, all I have to do is pick up the phone and say, help me. Uh, so this this could be a little trickier. I see John came off of mute, so maybe he's uh, maybe he's there and he can do it. I, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't find my Zoom window for a minute there, so I was just trying to struggle to get Zoom back. But I can certainly do a, a quick screen share and, and try to show you, um, you know, email is pretty straightforward. You just email us, but I can show you where our ITS website is in the ticketing tool. Wonderful. Thank you. So he'll pop that up as soon as he finds his share. There he goes. Um, so again, email is email, whether you're using Gmail or um, Hotmail because you're having college uh, account issues. Uh, that is more than acceptable. We can correspond with you that way. Or if you can use your Niagara College account uh, for some of these other questions, then um, again, it's basically uh, using email. I'm not going to demonstrate that. Uh, its.niagaracollege.ca is our website. It can be found off the main Niagara College website as well. And you'll see our contact info sort of around logging a ticket is here. Um, I actually might have gone the, the wrong way to this one. Um, I'm going to do that a slightly different way. College. Um, so this, uh, again, is linked off of our, our ITS website, and we have a client portal where you can log tickets directly, basically. Um, and you can look for something very specific. Um, you know, request software support or whatever. These just ask for a little bit of extra info. In our, in our um, experience, in most cases, students are just sending emails in if they need to. A lot of these are to request services and things like that. Um, but basically, um, sorry, I'm just struggling. I shouldn't have uh, jumped on this so quickly, John. I should have let you do it. Um, so account management is a possibility. Um, actually, that's so. Let's go with um, software support. Uh, and basically, you create a ticket, and you can go through. And they do make you sign in. So again, if you don't have access to your college account, email is your option. We don't allow sort of anonymous tickets. Um, but again, contact info is important um, just to make sure that what you have on file and it will start populating on its own. Um, and again, if you're going to go this way, off campus is typically what you're going to do. Um, room location won't matter. Uh, you can pick the name of the software or you can say other. Yeah, this is a long list. Um, and then just a description of what you have. Uh, and then when you hit requ request, it's basically going to give you a ticket immediately. Um, you'll get a, an email to your college account. That's the key. When you're doing anything through our services, 
it's basically going to log a ticket for you. And then basically you have the ability to follow up for status. Now, IT, if you email us, we always log a ticket for you and you'll basically have access to the ticket through your email. You can click on it, check status, that type of thing. But I would say in most cases, um, your best bet is to, to actually go through the, the email portion of it. It's just a little cleaner and easier unless you know specifically what your challenge is. Oh, wonderful. So for all of our students, when you have your MyNC account, you can log into MyNC or you can go to the um, IT uh, section of our website to be able to log in and put in a ticket. But you can also just simply email IT service desk at niagaracollege.ca uh, and they, our IT department will actually log a ticket for you and start working on a resolution for you. So you can do it two ways as you become more adept at working with our systems and you uh, get rolled into our systems a little bit more as a student. Uh, of course, this will be much easier to be able to navigate. Uh, but in the meantime, as you're just getting started, email is probably the fastest, easiest way to do it. Please do feel free to log in and check out the ITS service desk section of your MyNC portal. And you'll see a huge variety of different things that you can request assistance with, uh, as well as a knowledge base uh, that's housed there. I know I use that quite frequently when I need support or I need to be able to understand something and I want to do it myself. I look at the knowledge base and ITS has done a great job of providing uh, material to help you navigate different types of software and programs. Uh, so it's a wonderful site to be able to access, not just to resolve a specific problem of yours, but also to teach you how to resolve some of your own typical issues. As well, Howard, uh, I'm just going to share one little piece here, if I can. And of course, we love sharing. And this is uh, another share. Let me get this down. Uh, this should be the uh, Niagara College website, so www.niagaracollege.ca. Another way to reach us is through quick links, and it just says technical support, and you're on our page. So you don't even have to remember anything. It's a quick link, and it brings you right to the Information Technology Services page, and we've got all the information there for you to be able to go in and the enter a ticket. All of this stuff is actually... Uh, set up off of that page right away so you can very quickly uh, be able to get in and uh, and connect up with us. We also have a lot of help in here as we were pointing out and I think it's very important that uh, uh, people can actually get a whole pile of information uh, and be able to uh, without having to put up a ticket they can do a little bit of self-diagnosis and it should make their lives a lot easier than having to struggle through uh, some of the problems. So there's how to contact us, uh, the email, all the links are in here and uh, you can very quickly and easily reach out to us and all that information is available to you. The other really interesting part is if we're having a problem, and I think it's really important to note, if you're having a problem with getting onto Blackboard or something like that, our help desk actually puts up and tells you when there's a problem. Uh, and if Blackboard is a problem, we'll actually make this red and tell you what's going on with it. So if you can't connect to the Collaborate, which is part of the video, uh, to PeopleSoft, which is our registration system, uh, student email, if there's something wrong with Microsoft, we will try to tell you on this page very quickly what's actually happening. So I just thought uh, that would be another way for uh, students to remember where they don't have to remember all the buzzwords or even the IT service desk or any of the addresses. If you can just go to niagaracollege.ca, go over to the quick link like I was showing and drop down to technical support and you're right to us. Great, thank you. Um, this is a bit of an ITS question uh, related to um, when students are putting in their phone numbers or information into their, uh, their profile. Uh, one student is saying that they are only able to enter North American phone numbers. They're not able to add their phone number from India. So they seem to be missing, if, I guess, if I'm guessing right, the country code option. 
how do they do that in our system? Like, can we just put it as a regular text field and just put plus one, nine if, one? If that is in the PeopleSoft system, that would have to be a request to make a change that we could put that in. Uh, but if it's in your email or in your ticket, if you're entering it there, just put it into the body of the message to us uh, to be able to get to us. So the body of the message will be good enough and you could just say, leave that mobile number blank uh, if you can't fill it out appropriately and put it into the base or the base uh, uh, message. Perfect, and just so that uh, everyone is aware, uh, I know on the PeopleSoft side of things or on your registration system, when you applied, uh, you should have put in your uh, home country, including your country code. If you are updating that information, it is actually just one straight field. So you can actually put in plus nine one and the rest of your phone number and it won't restrict you from doing that. So you don't just have to use a US or Canadian phone number. You can use any of them. It's just an open field uh, and no worries there. Okay, so that was from Jason Deep Sidhu and I hope that answers your question. Um, Anything else in here? Uh, there are some questions about how to access their syllabus and study materials. And my assumption is that they'll find that on Blackboard. Is that right? When they've picked their timetable, they have to yes. pick their timetable and then they log in? It's part of the, every course has its own syllabus. So uh, whether the, I don't know whether the teachers post that on Blackboard. I think they do. Uh, so each one of their classes on Blackboard will have the syllabus as part of their uh, course materials that they'll be able to click on once they've selected their courses and they've made their payment, they'll get access uh, that automatically gets loaded up to Blackboard and they can see both the software, the book requirements, the whole works is, uh, is made available once they've actually made payment. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, John Howard, I can. I just wanted to jump on uh, and add a little piece there. So hi everyone, it's uh, Paul Kelly, International Student Advisor. Um, hey Paul, um, Mr. Saw, Famous I've, Paul. <laughs> I've been quietly in the background typing away some, some answers, but I did want to uh, jump on and, and, and uh, pick that one up if you guys didn't already grab it. But I did see a lot of questions earlier about that type of thing, about um, accessing reading uh, materials, reading lists, about how they're gonna find the course syllabus. So. The, the, the primary uh, learning platform that students need to at least make as their starting point to find out their uh, information about their professors, about their classes, is going to be Blackboard. Um, so I know John and John have mentioned a lot about some of the really wonderful technologies that we have available. Um, but if we just want to boil it down to at least like where you go first of all to get started with a lot of this for week one of classes or even before classes begin, it would be onto Blackboard go into your courses on Blackboard and in there on the, on the side, there should be a menu where you can access some of the course materials. And in there will be something called a course outline and a TLP, which is a teaching and learning plan. And the TLP in particular uh, will be uploaded by, as John mentioned a moment ago, will be uploaded by your professor, by your teacher, either just before the start of the term. Um, so at the start of September perhaps, or during week one for sure. Um, and usually the teachers will review that in the first class of term. So that's the, typically something they will do in the first week or the first class is to go over the TLP and over the materials with the students to make sure that the students know where it is, how to access it and answer any questions they may have. Um, a couple of things I will um, mention though is that th that might not be uploaded yet. Um, for a lot of students, Blackboard takes a little bit of time to update to reflect their actual schedule. So if you've picked your schedule in the Nicole timetable system, you may still not see the classes yet in Blackboard. Uh, don't panic if that's the case. They will appear and they will populate there closer to the start of term. Also, even when you have access to the class, so for example, if you click on Blackboard, you see the name of the class and you can even access that, it may be that the teacher has not yet uploaded uh, the course outline or the TLP. Um, something that's, that's obviously having to change right now is that professors are having to make sure that their materials, their reading lists are accessible to all students in, in all parts of the world. So transitioning from things like books that would be in the bookstore on campus to eBooks or, or online learning materials, 
may take them a little bit of time. So again, don't panic if your TLP or your reading list and material and your course outline is not posted until that first week of class. Um, the professors are working hard to update their materials and get that posted as soon as possible to give students advance, um, advance kind of warning and advanced preparation of that. But again, if it's not there quite by the start of class, that's something that your professor should be going over with you in the first week of class. So, so um, I think right now, uh, John and John and Howard mentioned this earlier, right now the things to be focusing on are selecting your timetable, making sure you're active in the program and you have your timetable selected. Uh, and Howard mentioned earlier as well about what to do, you know, regards immigration on that, but at least making sure you do have everything prepared and have your timetable selected. And the larger um, kind of overriding technology requirements that John uh, mentioned at the start of the presentation about making sure you have the right type of connectivity and, 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 uh, and hardware, um, the specifics about the exact type of software you'll need in your classes and the reading materials, that is something that will come over the next few weeks and during that first week of classes. Um, we, right now, it's just a case of making sure you, you have the, the major things in place and then those smaller points can be ironed out closer to the start of term. And Paul, uh, just to uh, Howard's point a little while ago, that, that's wonderful. Uh, information and, uh, and, and a great way to explain it. I just wanted to add to that, that next week, uh, there'll be a lot more on teaching and learning and I'm sure all of that material will be covered uh, um, uh, by the academic folks. Uh, again, in a lot more detail and I'm sure they'll give you uh, demonstrations. We don't load Blackboard uh, immediately up uh, until just before the beginning of term. And the reason being people are moving in and out of courses and it's a lot of overhead to move students around with, uh, within those courses. So uh, we will do a bulk load in the very near future and all those courses will start showing up. And after we've done our bulk load, we will actually do an update every single night uh, and be reflective of what's going on in the registration system. So if you change courses, we'll move you in those courses uh, uh, overnight. Perfect. Yeah, Thanks. thanks, John. Appreciate that. I know I get I I get a lot of emails as well with students that are that are essentially set at this point in time, um, and they're they're they're, they're um, encouragingly trying to get uh, prepared and ahead of the game. But but right now and on uh, what are we August twenty first today? It really is a case of having your timetable selected. Um, they've been open for a few days or a couple of, or a week or so now, uh, and having. Uh, your technology in place, your, your, your fundamentals, your, your equipment, to make sure that you have the right access. And then, um, as John mentioned, uh, closer to the start of term, things like the access to Blackboard will come and uh, connectivity with the professors and the, the teaching and learning plans will all then be uh, uploaded after that time. No, it's wonderful. Thank you, guys. And just a, a really simple, quick question. <clears throat> Do students have to how do students access Blackboard? Do they have to register for that separately than their MyNC account? Like, what do they do? Once you've created an account, if you can get onto the portal, you can get onto Blackboard at that point in time. Uh, if once you are considered to be a student at the college, you can get to Blackboard. Uh, the icon will be there, but you might not be able to click on it and do anything with it on the portal. Uh, you also, uh, uh, so you have to go through registration and you're still considered a new admit at that point in time. You do your registration and you then transition to becoming a student uh, within our systems. As soon as you transition to being a student, you will have access to all of the academic uh, material that we talked about and it will be populated by the academic areas uh, as they uh, 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 continue to uh, to add material to it. As an example, you might get into a course, but the faculty member or your instructor may not have uploaded all of their material yet. Uh, whether they're working on it or they just haven't put it up on their new course, because the course basically, if the student goes into the course, then the course goes poof and it's now available and the faculty member will upload uh, other material outside of uh, the teaching and learning plan and outside of the uh, course outline that are automatically loaded by the institution. Perfect. So again, uh, just for everybody who's watching, make sure that you have signed up for your MyNC account. Make sure that you have picked your timetable. 
And in your MyNC account, you will have an option with a little button, a little icon, you just click on it, it will take you right over to Blackboard and that's all automatic. Okay, but you can't do anything with it until you pick your timetable. So remember, pick your timetable. Definitely need you to do that right away so you have access. And join us next week as well for the session next week. Oh yes, and please join us. So thank you, thank you, John and uh, and Paul for reiterating that. Next week we have a full panelist of five members, two members from ITS, John and John, uh, as well as three of our academic areas, associate deans and deans. Uh, that will really talk about everything online. Uh, how is it that you do your online studies? I did have also see a question, a couple of quick questions about uh, students asking if their program is hybrid, does that mean that they're studying online or that they have to be in Canada on campus? Just to remind you, if you're studying in a hybrid program, that means that some of your programs, some of your courses are delivered here in Canada on campus. You are required to come here and you will have already received an email uh, telling you what you need to do and how to register for the Niagara College Comprehensive Quarantine Plan to make sure that you can arrive safely, that you can quarantine safely, and so that you can start your program safely. Um, so please make sure you do that. If you don't know uh, about that or if you haven't seen that email, you can also visit international.niagaracollege.ca. Uh, click on Future Students tab and you will see a step-by-step -step guide to arriving in Canada, which allows you access to be able to register for the quarantine plan, plan your arrival to Canada and start your studies if you're in a hybrid program. Again, if you're in a purely online program, uh, you should be studying from your home country for the fall semester and, being, and start preparing to arrive here for January as our programs are planned to continue on campus in January. And we'll provide you with more information as we approach or as we pass the uh, month of September and we're able to start uh, incorporating plans to help you have a safe arrival to Canada uh, preparing for January. Okay. All right, guys. Well, I think that's pretty much it. We've answered uh, pretty much all of the questions. I will keep the session open for another uh, five minutes if I can ask our team to pop into the Q&As and just clean up the last few questions that are there. We had about 109 questions answered so far, uh, and we received about 150 questions. So great session, guys, and, and glad that uh, our future students were so engaged. Uh, so another five minutes will still be online, but we won't be doing a live discussion. Uh, so we will be turning off our videos and our microphones and we'll simply be responding to the questions and answers for the next five minutes. Uh, and then I will close the session at uh, 10.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, try to get them in there as quickly as possible right now so our team can get responses to you. Thank you so much again, John and John, uh, for jumping in and, and just giving us a really uh, great holistic um, education about technology and how it's being used and how we're supporting our students and making sure that our students have all this great access, not just to software, but also to supports to be able to make sure that they have a smooth transition into their online programming. Uh, I really appreciate it. and. Uh, of course, your time is so valuable. So thank you again oh, so much. It's, we're here. We're here for the students. So thank you very much for inviting us, Howard. And uh, thank you for all of you for attending. Uh, I hope that uh, we were able to provide you with answers. And if not, you do have our email addresses and you do have uh, uh, the email to the help desk. Feel free to reach out to us on a continual basis. If you have any problems, we're here to help and we're here to make you successful. Uh, you, if you participate in your courses and connect up with us, and when you have a problem, we're here to be able to resolve it. Uh, good luck with your studies and uh, uh, hope to see you in person at some point or another. Uh, we are around quite a bit uh, on campus and you will run into us. If you see my face uh, and you're on campus, by all means, say hello. Um, I'm always available to students. Thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you. And guys, just so that you know, I did put into the uh, uh, Zoom webinar chat box. So go to the chat box. And I wrote down the email address to be able to contact uh, the IT service desk uh, email. So you've got that email right there. Just 
copy that, stick that somewhere safe onto your computers, save it as, this is in case of an IT emergency, I'm gonna email these guys, just post it in there, make sure you've got that. Uh, thank you so much everybody for joining and we're going to sign off now, but from wherever you are in the world, uh, we really look forward to welcoming you and you being able to call Niagara College and our Niagara community home. So thank you again, guys, and have a wonderful day. See you later.